especially the boys and girls and teens and our adults. We pray you bless each one that's come. We pray that something will be said or done here tonight. We'll bring, first of all, honor and glory to your name, and then also that will help us to be drawn closer to you. And those who are watching by means of the internet, that they will be blessed and they'll be touched and drawn closer to you. May your will be done. We'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thank you for being seated. How many of you are glad this warm inside here? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> All right. Take your Bible tonight. If you would, everyone get an outline. If you didn't, um, turn me down just a little bit, Fred. I'm echoing in my years here. Uh, if you didn't get an outline, raise your hand, Brother Terry, will get you an outline to the uh, study tonight. We're in Psalm 140, and uh, something that we really need for our lives. Uh, how many of you find yourself being confronted quite often with the matter of evil things. Amen. I mean, anybody else besides myself get confronted by evil things? Well, in case you don't think so, let me just talk about it just for a few seconds on all the evil things that you and I can be confronted with. Anybody here uh, hear any cursing on TV or radio lately? Raise your hand. Wave at me. Yeah, okay. If you didn't today, you didn't listen to the radio, all right? Or you didn't watch TV. I mean, uh, you know, it's all a balance. Uh, how many of you have seen something that uh, is immoral or along the long of immorality on TV or something like that, or even out in public recently? Raise your hand. Evil abounds, whether we like it or not. But you know, a lot of Christians are going around like this. They really don't see the evil that we really are confronted with. Why? Well, I personally believe, this is my theological input, I believe that we are in many much, uh, in, in much in the same days as it was in the days of Noah. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, the thoughts, the Bible says, and the uh, things that were going on that day, the thoughts and imaginations of the heart were evil continually. And David knew that, the psalmist that we're going to study tonight. And he really wants to get this thing across to us in regards to the evil that we're confronted with every day. And I'm going to show you something that it kind of hit me this week as I was studying. Uh, I've read the verses over and over and over again many, many times. But it just didn't dawn on me about this thoughts of evilness along that line. Um, a man by the name of Edward Burke, and maybe you've heard of him, he had a statement that is quoted so much among Christians today, and the statement is this. He said, all that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Let me read that again. All that is required for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And that's true. Because the thoughts and imagination of the heart are evil continually. So David was confronted with that. And I'm going to get you to respond tonight. So I, want you to, I hope you're in Psalm 140. Because I want you to look at this chapter. Because there's a lot of things in there. And we're probably not going to be able to hear it all. But at least I can give you somewhat of a, a, a study on the thoughts that we're talking about here. It starts out on verse number 1. It says, Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. And preserve me from the violent man. And it goes down through this whole chapter, and he wants to deal with the matter of this, this, this problem that you and I are all faced with, and that is evil. And so how can we deal with it? Well, in your, on your outline there, the first thing that I gave you was this. Ask God to take control. Because, I'm going to be honest with you, we can't deal with evil in ourselves, can we? Why? Take your Bible, keep your place in Psalm 140, and let's go over to Ephesians chapter 6. You've seen a lot of times, but I want to bring two, uh, two chapters into your focus tonight in regards to this matter that we've got to let God control, take control of this thing, because all around us, constantly, I see evil abounding in uh, such a manifested way on a daily basis, and it really concerns me because uh, it's like every time I turn around, I have to turn my head, or I have to close my eyes, or i got to put my fingers in my ears, okay? In Ephesians chapter 6, we begin with verse number 10. It says, 
Be strong. Come on, read it with me. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now, the question is this. Why should we be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might? Well, if you look at the rest of the verses there, he, he's giving something that's very beneficial for you and me, and that is the fact that we've got to be equipped with the right things because we have an adversary, the devil, but not only the adversary, the devil, and a lot of people, we think of the devil, and they, yeah, the devil made me do this, the devil made me do that, and you're right. But I've mentioned from time to time from the Pope that you and I have a trinity of wrong that comes against us. The flesh, the world, and the devil. If one's not hitting you, another one is. But a lot of Christians are really getting beat up today because they don't realize that they're being hit by every side. And they think, well, you know, the devil, he, yeah, he tempts you and you have the opportunity to say yes or no. Did you realize that? There's not one temptation you have to say yes to. Because God says there's no temptation that's common unto man where God has not made a way of escape. But will with the temptation make a way of escape. But he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Why? Well, look at verse 11, and here it gives you the answer. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And then he talks about all those things that you and I can do, and he ends up with the principle of prayer. Prayer is what David realized that he needed in his life in order for God to take control, because God won't take things out of your hands until you put them into his hands. You see, you and I will hold on to those things when God says, look, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Because we can't deal with the onslaughts of the devil and all the things he throws at us. We can't really deal with the flesh. That's the reason the Bible says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So he says, look, you've got to have this. Now, why is that true? All right, now you're in the book of, uh, of Ephesians. Turn to the book of Philippians. Uh, just uh, one book over. Uh, turn to Philippians chapter number uh, 4. And I've shared this with you before in some of the thoughts of studies that we've had before here on uh, Wednesday nights and even on Sunday morning, Sunday night. Uh, we talk about our thinking. I was counseling with a person this week, and we were talking about the, one of their counselors. They go to additional, uh, and they come to me in counsel. And one of the things, their, their counselor, and by the way, their other counselor is a Christian, but he says it's good for you to go to your pastor as well. And he told him, he says, you need to do, you need to meditate more. I says, well, he's right to a certain extent. I said, meditation is important for the Christian because the Bible says we ought to meditate on these things. I says, but there's a good meditation and there's a bad meditation. This transcendental meditation is wrong because in that you're inviting wrong spirits into your life. You're clearing your mind to let all kinds of, th kinds of things to come into your life. There's a proper meditation. Now, look at uh, Philippians chapter 4 and look at verse 8. Now, you've heard me quote this verse from time to time. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, say the next word with me. Think. think. You know what the word think there is? Meditate. Not just say, uh, yeah, I remember that. No, it's taking time and thinking on these things. Here's what I'm saying. Meditation is important because you're getting your mind geared towards the Lord. Now, when you meditate, for example, on purity, how can you think on purity? Because I ask you, did you see anything that was impure or immoral uh, or heard anything impure or immoral uh, on TV or maybe out in your workplace or wherever it might be? And uh, all of us do. Uh, anybody, anybody hear anybody curse today? If you didn't, you weren't around people. 
Unless you were shut up in your house by yourself. But if you watch TV, I guarantee you, you heard at least one curse word on TV. And that, that would be very mild. Okay? Because everywhere that you are, people are using wrong language. Okay? Now, I told this person, I said, here's what you need to do to help you in your meditation. When you think about the matter of being pure, you look up all the Bible verses you can find in the Bible that talk about purity. And then you read those Bible verses over. That will help you to meditate on the principle of purity by reading those verses over and over and over and over again. Let them become part of your life. Remember what Remember what the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, uh, the great man Solomon said, as a man thinketh, right? As a man meditates, huh? as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Now how do we get this meditation? Well, you get meditation through four things. Would you look at verse number 9 of Philippians 4? You and I meditate on things that, number one, that we have learned. Huh? We learn. Number two, the things you've received. Number thing, three, and this is probably the one that most, uh, uh, most of us will get, and that is the things that we hear. Okay? Or, the next one, the things that we see. All right? Those four things are what, co what comes into your in my life. They can be evil or they can be good. That's the reason we have to fight against those things that are evil. And we start out by letting God take control and being strong. Ephesians 6, verse 10 again. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. See? And so, uh, as you look at your uh, outline there... Uh, in verse 1, it talks about asking God to take control. The psalmist starts right off with one of the most important principles that Paul also talked about when he ended up, when he says, praying all with prayer and supplication. There in that verse, uh, uh, the 17th, uh, was it, the 18th verse that he gives there in Philippians chapter, uh, I mean, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 6. You and I have to fight against evil every day, but we are no match for the flesh, the world, the devil. All three. The evil trinity. See? That's the reason we have to depend upon the Lord. We have to let Him take control. Because He won't take things out of our hands. We have to put them in His hands. To let Him take control. But we a lot of times think that we can do it ourselves. We think that we can defeat, uh, for example, bad habits. We think that we can, uh, we can defeat looking at wrong things. The eyes can stray and look at anything wrong, and we shouldn't do it. Now, is it wrong to see something immediately? No. That, that's natural. It's that constant gaze, as I use the illustration. I may be driving down the road and I see something that's not right, it may be immoral. I can't help that. But if I look in the rearview mirror, I've yielded to temptation. Okay? Or if I turn my head around, I'm liable to have an accident in the first place, you know. But we got to let God take control of the things of our life. Now, he points out in this chapter, and I want you to, I want you to look with me. We're going to read all the, the, the verses there that he gives us, down through verse 13, because verse 13 there is very important as well. And I want you to pay attention very quickly on those that we have to be careful about, because people influence us, every one of us, don't they? By the things that we receive, the things that we learn, the things that we hear, the things that we see. People influence us in those because if we stand if we stand around and listen to a dirty joke, are we receiving something wrong from that person? Yeah. We're not only receiving it, but we're hearing it at the same time. See? And we're learning a bad habit. Okay? God wants us 
to be careful about the people. And so we can let God control. We can't control people, can we? But I know who can. God can. All right, so let's see what David says here as we look down through here. If I mention a person, I want you to speak out what kind of person that is. Just say it out, okay? When I read here, I want you to follow along in your Bible. And when I say something, someone that's bad, then speak out. Say that same thing again, okay? Here we go. Deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Evil man. Oh, come on, come on. Let's get with it here. All right. You got the point now? All right. Here. So I don't care if all of you say it at the same time. I want, if I say somebody that's not right, then I want, you to, I want you to speak up. As I read down through these 13 verses. Okay. I want, this, is, this is class participation. Let's get 100 in it. Okay. Here we go. All right. So let's go back to the beginning. David says, deliver me, O Lord, from the evil man. Preserve me from the violent man. All right. Which imagine mischiefs in their heart. Continually are they gathered together for war. Anybody see anything else there? All right. Mischief are divisive men. Okay. Who come up with wrong things to uh, instigate them into other people's lives. Okay. I know you don't see the exact words there, but mischievous men, that is good. Margaret got that one correct. You get an extra point. All right. Uh, let's go on here. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent. Evil speaking men, right? They speak, the, they speak wrong things. All they got, they got cursing on their lips. They got lying on their lips, so forth and so on. Okay, let's go on here. I'll come back to these verses in a minute because uh, of the additional things I want to give you. Uh, Adder's poison is under their lips, Selah. Now, what's the word Selah mean? Pause and meditate on what we just said. He wants us to get into our thinking, these people that are wrong, that can influence our life, that we've got to be aware of them. We've got to be careful about those people that they do not influence us for evil ways. All right? Uh, by the way, what I'm thinking here, real quickly, uh, when in, in the days of Noah, do you think all those people were evil all at once? How'd they get that way? Being around other people at work. Okay, let's say the word together. Influence. Come on, say it together. Influence, all right? Uh, uh, people are influenced by, uh, by, uh, uh, by the words that they say, by their actions, by their choices, and so forth. Now, look back, if you would, at verse number four. Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Now, he, he's praying here, Seal. Uh, preserve me from the violent man. Okay, do you see somebody else there real quickly in verse number four? Okay, violent. There's somebody else there. Look at it. What, what was that? Wicked. Wicked. Let's say it together. Wicked men. Okay, and it could be a wicked woman as well. Uh, wicked human beings. All right. He says, Keep your Lord from the hands of the wicked. Observe me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. The proud have had hid a snare for me. The proud man, all right? Uh, they exalt themselves. They, they want you to, uh, you know, be a person of pride. Uh, was there anybody who was the first in, uh, uh, individual to have pride? Who was it? Lucifer. Who? Satan. All right. Lucifer, Satan. Okay, Lucifer, because that, he, he became prideful. He says, I'll exalt myself above uh, God. I will become like the most high. And so he went to overtake God, see. And so that's when God threw him out of heaven, see. All right, and then he became the devil. He was Lucifer, uh, son of the morning. Uh, the, pri the proud have hid a snare for me, and cords they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gins for me. And then he says, Salah. He says, now think about those people. He wants you to avoid them. Now, let me say this. We know we have to be around co-workers and all that kind of thing. But it means don't let their influence overtake you. Uh, listen, we'd never be able to win a lost sinner to the Lord if we, uh, 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 you know, stay away from everybody, right? You've got to be around sinners. That doesn't mean you participate in their activities, okay? 
You don't let them influence you in the wrong way in your actions and your choices and so forth of life. All right? Verse 6, I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God, hear the voice of my supplications. Oh Lord, now you notice out through here, he constantly comes back to the fact that he has to keep praying. Prayer is a necessary weapon to overcome the evil individuals that influence you. Matter of fact, you and I ought to have more influence on the wicked than they have on us. We have, ought to have more influence on the violent man than they have on us. And so forth and so on, the people we've mentioned up to this particular point uh, in the lesson. So he says, uh, we need to be careful. All right, now look at verse 7. O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation, thou hast covered my head in the day of battle. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Once he, again, he comes back to the wicked person. Further, uh, uh, further not his wicked device. Lest they exalt themselves, once again, that's pride. And then he says, think about that. Meditate on that. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Once again, a mischievous person. Let them burn coals far up on the, uh, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire into deep pits that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker. Come on. Evil. evil speaker, all right? In other words, people are going to go around saying things that are not right, so forth and so on. Evil speakers, all right? Uh, th those are classified under these people that David is saying we got to be careful about, we got to be aware about, uh, aware of them and uh, avoid them in their influence, okay? Not that we avoid them altogether, but we avoid their influence, all right? So he says, uh, let not an evil speaker be established on, in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow him. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right of the poor. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. So the, the very first thing that he says that you and I need to do in order to deal with evil is we've got to let God contr take control. All right? We've got to turn the thing over to the Lord and say, now Lord, make me aware of these individuals. Now, did you get the individuals down? All right. If you didn't, try to go back through the chapters we're writing, uh, as we're going over it. Write these people down. Then, here's the key. Ask God to give you victory over the evil speaker, the violent man. You understand what I'm saying? Just name them to God. Say, give me victory over these. Take control, Lord, that I'll not be influenced by these people. See. Now, the second thing is... We not only take and let God take control, but we ask Him for specific deliverance. Now listen to me very carefully. We have, because of we have the fleshly nature, we have to ask God, Lord, if there's anything I'm watching, if there's anything I'm listening to, and so forth and so on, help me to be aware of it all the time. And turn away from it. See, we have to ask God to do that. Not only do we ask him to take control in making us aware of the things that, that may bring evil into our lives, we must ask God to give us victory over those things. We ask God to help us not to listen to the wrong things, to see the wrong things, to do the wrong things, to choose the wrong things. See, ask God to do it. For example... Yeah, write this verse down in your notes if you've got a, got a pen. Matthew 6, 13. You're aware of it and familiar with it. It says, and lead us not into temptation. Now stop right there. Remember, that comes from the section where the disciples asked Jesus to teach them how to pray. You and I would be a lot better off of every day that we begin our day with, Lord, lead us not into temptation. In other words, Lord, help us overcome and not yield to that temptation that comes into our life uh, by, the, by the, the devil or the world or the flesh that confronts us with it. Uh, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. See, uh, that's very important. That's Matthew 6, 13. Then in John 17... Uh, talking about praying, asking God, praying, God, give us deliverance. Write this down. John 17, verses 15 through 17. 
John 17, 15 through 17. Now, I'm not going to read those out loud myself, but who would like to read those? Who would like to look up those verses and read them out loud for us? Anybody here tonight? All right, Pam, would you look up John, and I'll come back there in just a few minutes uh, in regards to that scripture, John 17, verses 15 through 17. Asking God is a very important thing because what we're doing in the asking, we're asking God to take full control, yes, but we're giving him permission in different avenues of our life. For example, if you have a problem with things that, uh, that uh, you would look at that are wrong, and, and folks, it's hard today. I mean, you, you, you're watching a good program and all of a sudden, some stupid commercial comes on that gives you the wrong connotation. Gives you the wrong thoughts. It, it, it's, we're constantly bombarded with the evil uh, connotations that come across in commercials and so forth and so on. It's, it's like they had to throw something dirty in there. Okay? And if we're not careful, then we, become, we, we get dirty minds. We begin to think wrong, along the wrong things that God would not for us to, to think about. Pam, would you uh, stand and read those verses out loud, okay? I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Okay, now you notice there in that verse he says, uh, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. Okay, because we're going to have that come at us on a daily basis. Sanctify means, you know, get them apart from that. Pull them out of that. See, and here's the great thing. Not only are you praying to God, but Jesus is praying for you too. Huh? He's praying to the Father. There's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. See? Now, why would Jesus pray for us? Because Jesus was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Therefore, he's able to succor, in other words, to bear up to help them that are tempted. Do you know why Jesus had to go through the temptation in the wilderness there in Matthew chapter 4? So he could help you and me. He wants us to know that he went through the same thing and he got victory over it. And he can give us victory. See, the Bible says we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. So not only do we have to let God take control uh, so we don't get involved in evil, we got to ask him and you know, how, Lord, what, what should I do about this instance that I'm constantly being bombarded by this particular thing in my life? See, what, what, what should I do? See, so you and I have a rescue plan. All right, look at verse 3. Well, going back to verse 2, which imagine mischiefs in our heart. Uh, doesn't the Bible say, out of the heart proceedeth all these things, these evil things and so forth? That's why you and I have to understand it's a natural thing for an unsaved person to come up with the wrong things. It's natural. By the way, it's natural for us too, isn't it? See, It's natural because we have the fleshly nature to succumb to that kind of thing. That's why we need to be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. See? Now, look there at verse number 3. Number 3 in your outline, remember God made their tongue in their voice box. So He can do something about that. Uh, look at verse 3. They have sharpened their tongues like a serpent, adder's poison is under their lips, Salah. And so uh, David comes back in verse 4, and he gives us the next thought, and that is, look, God, God can take and deal with these people. Now, let me give you a couple of verses to write down. Psalm 64, verse 8. Here's what it says. So they shall make their own tongue to fall upon themselves. All that see them shall flee away. God's going to turn the thing in reverse. Huh? He's going to make the thing that they say to fall back on them. Let's use an example. Can anybody give me an example in the Old Testament of someone who tried to do evil to somebody and the thing came back on them? Haman. Haman. Remember in Esther? 
Esther, the, uh, uh, evil Haman, he was going to take and, uh, uh, you know, kill the Jewish, have the Jewish people killed. And he was going to hang Mordecai on the gallows. Who got hung? Okay, God makes the thing come back on. God does it on that. He can do it about the tongue. You know, what they say can come back on them. See, it's like the old chickens come home to roost, huh? God wants us to know if we're turning everything over to him, let him be in control and we pray about it. God's going to work. Here's another verse. Ezekiel 3.26. You can write that down. Ezekiel 3.26. And I will make thy tongue cleave to the roof of thy mouth, that thou shalt be dumb, and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. God can turn that thing around in regards to your uh, good and against that person who might be using slander or whatever. They might be saying something against you. All right? Look at verse 4. Ask God to keep you. You ever pray this? God put a divine hedge of thorns around me today. Put a shelter over me. Put a defense around me. God to do it. Matter of fact, you ought to pray that every day. That's important. Ask God to keep you. Here in verse 4, he says, Keep me, O Lord, from the hands of the who? The wicked. All right? Preserve me from the violent man who have purposed to overthrow my goings. In other words, they're out to do everything they can to make you look bad. They're out to even catch you up, get you involved in things that are wrong. Have you ever been approached by somebody to do something wrong? Oh, nobody will know it. You, you go ahead and take that. Nobody, listen, you work here, it belongs to you. No, it doesn't belong to you. See, but listen, I work for Cincinnati Diamond Tool Company. There were guys who carried tools out there. They stole them. That's wrong. Taking anything that doesn't belong to you is stealing. Amen. The devil will use people to make you think it's okay to do that. It's not okay. It's wrong. It's sin. All right? And we need to ask God to keep us. And that's very important. Very first four. All right, look at verse five. The proud have hit a snare for me. The cords, they have spread a net by the wayside. They have set gems for, the, for me, Silah. In other words, it says, now meditate about this. God is able to keep you from stepping into a trap. The devil's out there. The word uh, uh, there in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, talking about the snares of the devil, uh, a snare is a trap. Okay? And the devil's going to constantly try to put traps in your way and make you fall. He's going to do all kinds of things to your life to keep you from doing what God wants you to do. Well, listen, let me give you something. When something happens to you that keeps you, tries to keep you from coming to church or going to witness to somebody or doing that which is right or whatever, you just start praying about that. Say, God, I don't know why this has happened. Now, if this is from you, I'll accept it. But if it's not, I want you to clear it up. And He will. See, you ask God to keep you, and to help you. All right, look at verse 6. God wants us to do something very important in regards to our relationship with Him. What is that? Well, look at verse 6. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Remember who God is. He's your God. Amen. Not only that, here's something closer. And tell me if I'm wrong. He's our Father. Amen. Amen. There's a father, a right type of father. I know there's fathers that don't care anything about their kids or, you know, their wives or whoever it might be. But a real father, is he concerned about his kids? I want to tell you something. Don't do anything to my kids. More than that, don't do anything against my grandkids. You in trouble. <laughs> God wants us to know He's our Father. And He will take care of us. He'll take care of us from the violent man, from the wicked man. Those who try to lay a snare or trap in our way. 
He's your God. He's your Savior. He's your protector. He's your Lord. He is the blessing controller of all situations. And we're to leave him in his hand. What situations are we talking about? All right. Verses 7 through 11 talk about those situations that you and I have to deal with on a daily basis. Uh, look at verse 7. It says, O God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. Thou hast covered my head in the day of what? Battle. battle. Now let me ask you a question. Are we in a battle every day? That's, right. That's why I gave you Ephesians chapter 6. He talks about putting on the whole armor of God. He knows daily when you step out of that house, well, even before you step out of that house, you're in a battle. When you get out of the bed of a morning, you're in a battle. Okay? Let me ask you a question. Now raise your hand, answer it yourself. Anybody else besides the preacher have a hard time getting up on Sunday morning? Amen. <laughs> I can get up any other day of the week, but on Sunday morning I just feel, oh, cause if I could just sleep another two hours. I could that's me. Oh, just 20 more minutes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brenda will settle for 20. I'll take 20. Give, give me an hour. Okay. All right. Now look there. We're in a battle. Uh, and so we need God's keeping. We need God's help. We need God's strength. And uh, we need to remember who God is. And he goes on down through verse, uh, verse number 8. Grant now, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Uh, further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves so long. As for the head of those that compass me about, let the mischief of their own lips cover them. Let burning coals fall upon them. Uh, in other words, he talks about burn them up with shame. All right? Uh, let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits, that they rise not up again. Let not an evil speaker be established in the earth. Evil shall hunt the violent man to overthrow them. So remember who God is, that he's able to overtake these people and deal with them in their life. But wait a minute. Look at verse 12 and 13. That's vital in regards to you and I overcome this matter of evil because we're being bombarded about where uh, evil abounds in our lives. No matter where we are, it abounds. But we can deal with it. And David shows us how here. Look at verse 12 and 13. Remember who you are. We're a child of the King. Amen. We're a child of God. We're a Christian, and Christian means to be Christ-like in everything that we do in our life. Folks, just remembering who you are will keep you from evil. I know. My daddy, years ago, said, listen, you've got a reputation to keep. The Moors have a reputation, and you're to keep that reputation, reputation, repetition, a reputation, not repetition, repetition in a right way. And if you go out here and you, 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 you do something wrong, you're going to bring shame upon our family's name. Don't do it. I'm your daddy. You're to do right, okay? Remember who you are. You belong to him. Look at verse 6. I said unto the Lord, Thou art my God. Hear the voice of my supplications, O Lord. You are afflicted one. Sometimes God permits affliction to come into our life. To humble us. To keep us in the right place. But I'm glad that Jesus was afflicted like we are. That he can sympathize with us. Let me give it to you. Put down, if you would, Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 th 14 through 16. Because of time, I'll go ahead and read it tonight. Otherwise, I would have somebody else read it. It says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, in other words, our Christian testimony. For, we're not a, for we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempered like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly on the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, he says, you belong to him, you're afflicted one, but wait a minute, let me give you something else. Look at our verse number 12. Remember who you are, who you are. you're righteous. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and the right 
of the poor. Matter of fact, he shows us uh, several things there. He says, number one, you are right, which means you're a righteous one. Listen, we were unrighteous until we got saved. Am I right? That's right? After we get saved, we become righteous through the person of Jesus Christ. But not only that, he says, you're upright. In other words, to be upright is to live right, to do right, to be a right example before people that they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. But I like this last one. Look at verse 12. What's the last one there that God calls us? He says, the right of the what? He's talking about poor in spirit. There in Matthew, talks about, you know, uh, we call them the Beatitudes. Poor in spirit. In other words, you've got a humble spirit. You've humbled yourself in the sight of God, and He's going to lift you up. That's important. Now, what can we do with all this? Look at verse 13. Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. The upright shall dwell in thy presence. What are you and I to do? We're to put action into our life. What's the action we should we do? Well, the first thing is, I told you, we ought to pray. In everything, by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. Secondly, here in verse number 13, Surely the righteous shall give thanks unto thy name. God wants us to thank Him for, the, for His strength and His power in our life that we can overcome evil. The Bible says don't overcome evil. Uh, he says uh, don't, you know, don't live evil, but overcome evil with good. Do what's right. Be right. Live right. So He says, look, our action is to pray. Our action is to thank Him for all he does and his ability to overcome the evil. And then he says, The upright shall dwell in thy presence. Listen, if you are dwelling in the presence of the Lord, guess what has, has to happen? Evil has to flee. Because God is a holy God. And no evil can stay where he is. So if you're in his presence, you're living and abiding in his presence. And that means walking in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16 says, Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So you and I can overcome evil. We don't have to let evil defeat us. We can defeat evil through being in His presence, praying, yielding, and asking God to deliver us from those things that would turn our hearts and living like the violent man and the proud man and all the other wicked man and so forth and so on like that because he is going to give us victory over those people. Now here's a closing verse. Greater is he come on say it with me. Greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. First John tells us that. I believe it's chapter 4. You and I do not have to live an ungodly life, an evil life. As a Christian, we can live pure lives. Now, we're human still. We still have the flesh, but we can overcome the flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word tonight. I pray that each one of us will take this chapter and meditate on it and think on those things that are honest and pure and lovely of good report and all the other things that Paul exhorted us there to do in, in the book of Philippians chapter 4, 4 and verse 8. And we be careful about the things that we listen to, the things that we hear, the things that we learn, the things that we receive from most people that try to push the wrong things on our life. Will it be in the things that uh, might come all across uh, a, a radio program or a, a TV program or out in the community that we might be, uh, uh, Lord, uh, communicating with people that we would avoid evil and we would do good. May your will be done. We love you, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.